Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome back once again to the uh, very fantastic lecture series on uh, introduction to science fiction studies. I have used the word fantastic not because this series is fantastic but because of the word fantasy. From fantasy we get the word fantastic which means it has elements of fantasy in it. Fantasy is something which is magical, something which is unearthly, something that has not been seen before, has not been heard of before. So this lecture series, you have come to know in this lecture series that there are a lot of things out there uh, about time, about space, about aliens that people are writing about, people are thinking about them, uh, conjecturing, uh, speculating, visualizing fields where these elements can be integrated into literature, film, other media platforms. So science fiction studies most of all tries to bring those fantastical elements along with the explanation of science. Sometimes there are elements of scientific truth which we have not witnessed before in our eyes but they are there out somewhere. Right, so we will begin this lecture on eugenics, genetic engineering and science fiction on this note that even if we don't see or don't know about it or don't talk about it in day to day life these things actually exist and is in the uh, path of development evolution of the species of human beings. So let us first try to understand what is the meaning of the word eugenics. The concept of eugenics started mostly from the 1920s. If you remember, the 1920s was the time when the world war was taking place. Yes, the first world war, the second world war, uh, the first world war started from 1914, ended in 1918. The second one was started in 1939, ended in 1945. So this particular gap, 1918 to 1939, during this time, Eugenics was something people were talking about, people were discussing and mostly related to the war prone reality of that time. So we will also know why this is like that in some time. Let us first go and understand the word eugenics. If you open Merriam Webster's dictionary, you will find that the practice or advocacy of controlled selective breeding of human population. Now, first of all, we have to understand what is meant by breeding of human population. Does it not include or is it some way different from reproduction? Because reproduction is actually something very akin to breeding, right? But why does, why are we using breeding instead of reproduction? Well, reproduction is a natural process. It has no common purpose. Yes, of course, uh, subconsciously we all reproduce so that the human race can continue on this planet. But when we say the word breed, it has a different connotation. It has a, a animal like behavior attached to that particular word. So breeding we use in case of domestic animals mostly, dogs, cats, uh, cows. We use the word breed in their cases when they reproduce we say breeding but when we say breeding of human population that means there is a purpose of another human being another party who has some kind of gain or some kind of relation to the breeding of the human beings as by sterilization so controlled selective breeding now this is the other part that i'm going to talk about what is controlled breeding well if there is a party or a government which is in power and they are asking their citizens not to reproduce at a particular time or to reproduce at a, another particular time or 
to keep at least uh, one or maximum two children. I am sure by the time I am saying this sentence, you are remem remembering one or two countries of the world, right? Where uh, this thing is uh, practiced, especially in China. You cannot have more than two children. Anyway, so let's come back. Here, that means that environment does not support natural reproduction. So if a person wants to have more than two children, what is that person supposed to do? That person does not have the sanction of the government. He or she cannot have more than two children. So that is controlled breeding. And it is not something which is natural, right? It is different. It is some human intervention into other humans' reproduction system. In 1883, Francis Galton, a British individual, coined the term eugenics to encompass the idea of modification of natural selection through selective breeding for the improvement of humankind. Now we have another parameter to the selective breeding. Improvement of humankind. What does that mean? How can you improve a humankind? We can improve a system. We can improve a machine. But what does it really mean to improve humankind? Well, uh, this is a quotation from Jeremiah A. Barondus and uh, you will find this in Merriam-Webster's dictionary as well. We will talk about the improvement after we go through another definition. A half century ago, eugenics became associated with Hitler, genocide and master race theories and its reputation has never recovered. This is something Dan Seligman says. So, when one human being thinks that this is a standard. Suppose there are two human beings. This is human being A, human being B. So human being A says that if you are to be a very good or a very perfect human, then you must have at least uh, 10 scores out of 20 you must at least score 10 points out of 20. That way you will be a perfect human being. But B says that no, I have scored according to your parameter, according to the points that you have set, I have scored only 5. Then A will say that no, if you have scored 5, then you are not a perfect human being you should not be allowed to reproduce. Now, A has set the parameter that one point for very good muscle structure, another point for very sharp memory, another point for very good eyesight, another point for very uh, positive energy in your body, always trying to work, always trying to help, another point for, let's say, developing skills like language skills, uh, working skills, another point for um, good motor skills. If somebody does not meet all the criteria, then that person is considered, okay, you have not scored 10 points out of 20, then you are an average or below average human being. So, if you reproduce, you are going to produce babies, you are going to produce more human beings who are substandard. And if substandard human beings are more in number, then how can we say that the human race is going to improve? Because substandard human beings will not do the work properly, will only create trouble. All of these things will happen. So they said that you shouldn't, uh, A said to B, that you are not allowed to reproduce. You will not have children. So that way, after 50 years, a lot of A's, A-type human beings, will be more in number than B-type human beings. So if A-type human beings are more in number in the world, with very good physical abilities, with very sharp memory, with very good intelligence quotient, very good emotional quotient, very good social quotient, then the society will progress faster than ever. That is the idea of eugenics. But see, the problem is, it tells 
any human being who does not score according to that uh, card they have set, according to the parameters they have set, that you are bad, you are less of a human being, you should not exist. So there is a class division created between the two parties, that there is one elite class of human beings and there is one average class of human beings and there is lower than that, uh, you know, below average, this kind of thing. So then there is a social hierarchy based on anatomy. What is anatomy? Anatomy is the structure of our body, our entire physical structure, the biology that is involved in it, uh, our human body, human anatomy and also our psychological um, abilities. If we have a good uh, brain, then we have a good memory and the brain pathways are very fresh, all of these taken into account. So, if we are going to divide the planet, divide the human race around the world based on this particular principle that there are high functioning human beings and there are burden like human beings, then we are just, you know, becoming machines. We are just behaving like stupid animals. Stupid not in the sense as a, a reproachful word, it is because of lesser intelligence. If we are intelligent, we will design ways to help those who cannot help themselves. We, if that goes on, then who those children who are born crippled, who do not have all of their body organs functioning properly, according to that idea of eugenics, they must be killed at birth. So that is a very dangerous area. So eugenics, people started this A kind of people, they will never allow a disabled child or a specially able child to survive on this planet. They will immediately kill it and say that this is justified because human race needs improvement. This is the improvement we have been talking about so far. So at first you thought, oh, improvement, it is a very nice thing. But let me tell you, this is only euphemism. Euphemism, uh, you can take a note of this word, euphemism. Euphemism means saying something bad, but using good words for it. Like if somebody dies, then you don't say that he's dead. You say he's gone or he has left this earth for the eternal abode. So that is euphemism and improvement here is also euphemism. It is like saying domination of the naturally strong and intelligent creatures over the naturally weak and unintelligent or not matching that level of intelligence creatures. So whenever there is a power hierarchy, whenever there is a distribution like that, Whenever there is a distinction like that, that there is one higher creature, then there is one lower creature, then, then there is one bottom creature, then there is a power flow, there is a power structure. When this power structure starts taking place, a society is bound to disintegrate. Because we are human beings, right? We are social human beings. Sometimes I am wrong, my partner is right. So my partner helps me when I cannot manage something. When I see my partner making a mistake uh, or doing something wrong, I go and help my partner because we are not perfect. We uh, live by helping each other. We are a colony. That is what humanity is all about. If you are destroying the imperfections in human beings, that means you are destroying scope for human beings to be kind, to be considerate, to be friendly, to be helpful. You are not letting any place for human beings to breathe, to become vulnerable, to cry. Because you are selected, right? You are selected because of your physique, your intelligence and everything. Had you been weaker, you would have been killed. So the entire idea of eugenics is in contrast with whatever the human beings stand for. I'm sure by now you understand the entire scenario. So first of all, it, it comes like a very rosy kind of thought that eugenics is good. It wants the human species to improve. But let me tell you, 
the top portion that is floating it is the tip of an iceberg i'm sure you know that ice uh, you know one tenth of it floats over water and uh, nine tenths of it is submerged or i think one eleventh of it floats over water and the rest is submerged so similarly eugenics whatever people understand or whatever people were made to understand was the portion that was floating on the water the entire uh, iceberg that is submerged below the water that is dangerous that calls for people killing other people right so moving on to after the second world war eugenics became a word to be hedged with caveats in britain and virtually a dirty word in the united states where it had long been identified with racism now if you remember hitler what hitler did was all the jews should leave the land and only the aryan race right aryan race tall people blue eyes very sharp nose uh, high intelligence quotient according to them only this race should be allowed to live on the earth all the other races should be annihilated that is what the entire nazi regime advocated for they uh, floated this idea they believed this idea they made sure that this idea was imposed on all the residents of germany whenever they found some other race uh, women they forcibly um, impregnated them uh, by the men of the aryan race so that their race gets extinct so that she may not pass down her race uh, instead the male uh, the aryan race must continue such uh, i am sure you understand it is such twisted such complicated such evil a plan okay so in usa we get to know that it was thought of as a dirty word nobody liked it everybody whenever somebody called it said or uttered the word eugenics they immediately thought of racism now let us have some more ideas about eugenics there are two main branches of eugenics see sometimes we need to know about our enemy in order to defeat it right so we are going to know about eugenics a little bit more so that we remain cautious on our part not to promote it in any way there are two main branches of eugenics positive eugenics this involved encouraging individuals with desirable traits such as intelligence or physical prowess to have more children supporters believe that this would lead to the propagation of beneficial traits in the population so this was positive eugenics even positive eugenics is bad what positive eugenics did they said that the people who have very good intelligence and physical prowess they were muscularly built heavily built no physical damage or uh, hereditary diseases no um, genetic diseases you those people were asked to produce more children even if they don't want to they were asked by the government that you produce more children you reproduce so that people in this area they become more like you what is negative eugenics this focused on preventing those with perceived undesirable traits now i have skipped the word desirable now i'll be discussing that after this such as disabilities or certain diseases from reproducing this could involve forced sterilization marriage restrictions or even euthanasia in extreme cases desirable and undesirable is strictly cultural a person living in the western country will never desire for a physical trait like the black colored skin to uh, continue on this planet similarly a person living in the depth of the african continent will never accept white colored skin to continue as a race so both are completely different both are completely different physical traits and both would want their traits to go on but in eugenics what they do is that the government decides which trait should go on a very uh, again a very complex and twisted mentality they will say that no people 
who do not have this color of skin they should be forcibly sterilized sterilized means they will not be allowed to reproduce anymore biologically they will be operated on uh, their uterus will be removed or they will undergo vasectomy tubectomy which is sponsored by the government and will not be allowed to reproduce so thereby the government will ensure that that particular physical trait does not move on to the next generation of citizens of this country so that is negative eugenics now i once again draw your attention to this word desirable and undesirable these two are very unprofessional words and very opinion based and that is almost like private opinion one culture will have one kind of opinion the other culture will have other kind of opinion so we are not really talking about human civilization improvement we are just concerned about my race improvement so that is again a very sick concept after world war 2 eugenics lost favor thank god for that and most countries abandoned or modified their eugenics policies you won't believe when eugenics was first talked about in the 1920s all the countries who were associated with the world war they started thinking like that that oh yes this this is a very good concept we will have more uh, you know efficient soldiers soldiers who can think on their feet who can uh, win a war everything was war centric at that time all the government policies were war centric people were um, doing their work in their own country but paying their taxes uh, the taxes of which were going to the war the war first world war and second world war so every institution every organization of the nations involved in the war all the policies they were producing or the policies they were designing everything was revolving around the wars so eugenics was also one of those policies today eugenics is widely condemned as a violation of human rights and a dangerous attempt to engineer human populations based on subjective and flawed criteria there is no one criteria when there is no single criteria when the number of nations increase the number of countries increase the number of criteria increases there is no single criterion so criteria is a plural word in itself so one is criterion so criterion is a singular word criteria is a plural word so it is completely subjective the idea of eugenics is subjective it is a uh, culture based and related to one kind of people nowadays in today's world eugenics is widely condemned widely condemned means everybody hates eugenics whoever like us did in um, while in the us when eugenics was uh, is pronounced everybody hears racism so now it is throughout the world this has become if anybody talks about one particular race dominating over the entire world in future people start thinking this person is crazy or is an evil person so right everybody started condemning such thoughts and violation of human rights human rights is that i am born with you know some basic human rights i have the right to my life i have right to freedom i have right to speech i have right to education if eugenics become a part of the policy of the government these rights will no longer be there human rights will be a fictional concept nobody will know what does that mean it will not be implemented eugenics and science fiction uh, we will try to engage the idea of eugenics along with uh, the idea or the science fiction works that are there so early depictions Science fiction literature from the late 19th and early 20th century sometimes portrayed utopian societies that used eugenics as a means to create perfect human populations. Novels like Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy and Her Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman touched on eugenic ideas. So if you go and look at the story of Looking Backward uh, written by Edward Bellamy when I am talking about other things you can just a uh, time travel especially you can just go and have a look at edward bellamy's uh, looking backward i have discussed it in details 
there they have the concept of eugenics not exactly eugenics they don't know how it is working but it is accepted as a policy inside the novel right and her land by charlotte perkins gilman so these two books they have roughly touched upon the idea of eugenics ethical considerations science fiction often used eugenics themes to spark discussions about ethical concerns related to genetic manipulation loss of individuality and discrimination based on genetic traits we have discussed most of these points that is ethical concern when we come to the stage of talking about ethics there is a whole range of idea called bioethics in the course on advanced studies on science fiction uh, we will be discussing bioethics in details it is almost um, something of a kind of a code which all the scientists of the world they follow you cannot clone a human being that is what bioethics says because if you clone a human being then it will there will be so much complications that you will start thinking because there will be questions like whether the person is a citizen which one is the original which one is the clone and uh, the health complications are a completely different thing and if it is a human being it will have human rights it will claim its own identity but it will be biologically exactly the same uh, like a car from the original human what will we do with that carbon copy how will the legal system um wrap around this kind of identity so lots of questions are there and therefore bioethics have come to this conclusion that no you cannot clone a human being there will be no reproductive cloning so ethics in eugenics similarly it is applied that if you are talking about building perfect human beings then you mean to say that imperfect human beings who are born in this planet they do not belong here so the art literature culture engineering uh, mathematical and physics related science related contributions they are doing towards the society the research they are uh, undertaking so the civilization can move forward it is all nonsense that means a disabled person cannot contribute intelligent uh, intellectually towards the society so if you are killing a disabled person that means you are killing a lot of possibilities and hopes for the future suppose somebody killed stephen hawking when he uh, was diagnosed with uh, the disability what would have happened we would have not have had the black hole theory we do, would not have had the idea of uh, hawking's radiation we would not have even uh, the approach to look at the farthest and the nearest black hole that we have ever seen in this universe so disabled people have their contribution towards the society and if if we go by the rules of eugenics we are committing murders as simple as that so ethically it is not sound related to genetic manipulation now if human beings are manipulated if i donate my child you know um, ovum and say that you modify it genetically so that it becomes a superwoman and the the, the uh, whoever the child the child that is born will have no disabilities will be very intelligent will do this will do that that is not how it works we will talk more about it we will talk about uh, more about genetic manipulation in the advanced course especially we will talk about a series called the boys it's a science fiction series where a particular serum is given to pregnant mothers and uh, in order to create mutant children so that they can become superheroes it's a different thing uh, it's a very interesting rather tv series we'll talk about it later lessons from history some science fiction works use eugenics as a cautionary tale drawing parallels to historical attempts at implementing eugenic policies and the potential dangers of such practices so uh, some of the science fiction works that are published they try to tell the readers that if you mess with nature uh, the nature will mess with you if you are uh, trying to change the course of evolution if you are trying to modify human beings for your own purpose some day it will come back and bite you in the leg 
that means it will uh, provide you with uh, the best opportunities of human uh, civilization destruction right transhumanism i have written uh, transhumanism because humanism was a part in uh, the civilization when human beings were most concerned about the humanity the individuality as human beings and promotion of human values we have crossed that stage we are now in the post humanism phase we are no longer human beings we are consumers we are no longer human beings we are voters we are no longer human beings we are employees in an institution that means uh, you are given money so that you can work if you don't work then it is up to you there will be no human consideration so that is something again very um, you know sick modern science fiction frequently delves into the themes of transhumanism where advancement in biotechnology and genetics blur the line between eugenics and the pursuit of enhancing human capabilities so biotechnology has been working on improving the human capabilities one of them that has already worked is the increasing of the average lifespan of a human being earlier it was 25 30 long back you know 300 400 years back it was uh, 40 maximum nowadays it is 60 70 that is the average lifespan of course there are many people who are living for more than 100 years now at this uh, stage but uh, even then the average life expectancy of a human being has increased due to the advancement in medicine and other fields but eugenics says that no we are not stopping there we are actually going to uh, modify the uh, tamper with the genetic code of human beings so that humans can live for 200 years that is possible uh, with genetic engineering and if we know how to do it if we discover that process but is it right that is a different question altogether so transhumanism means beyond the humanity beyond the concept of humanity why would you want a human being to live 200 years everybody would like love to live for 200 years but if we are living for 200 years this earth will be overpopulated and in less than 100 years time we will no longer have space to give to our children so if we are going to increase the life expectancy of the human beings we'll also have to make uh, provisions make accommodations for the living beings to stay alive right so in line between eugenics and the pursuit of enhancing gene- uh, human capabilities human genetic engineering contemporary science fiction explores the potential consequences of human genetic engineering and designer babies raising questions about ethical boundaries and the nature of humanity this is exactly the concept that is shown in the tv series called the boys the boys are uh, you know i have already mentioned that story before that mothers they come forward uh, they say that okay i want my child my unborn child to be uh, a super woman or a superman so the company they give the mother some money and they inject a liquid into the um, fetus that is growing inside the mother's body and wait that what the liquid is going to do is it is going to create some kind of mutation in the genetic code of the child and the child will develop super human qualities perhaps the child can develop uh, a quality to run faster than everybody or can develop uh, some sort of uh, you know super power of shooting laser through the eyes or maybe control electricity control fire control wind control water so all of these things can be a part of um, you know the project this particular company has undergone but the only condition is that if the child is born then the company will see whether the child has very good superhuman powers and then the uh, company will take the child and make a group of superhuman beings and fight crimes and make video and spread the video 
uh, create content for the entertainment lovers. Such a consumerist reality we are living in. Some science fiction works with eugenics as a part or a sub part directly or indirectly within their narrative. Number one, Brave New World. When we were talking about dystopia, when we were talking about Huxley, we have paid a special tribute to Brave New World because this is one of the best sellers ever, one of the best kind of literature that has been ever written on dystopia, on genetic modification, on classifying human beings based on their uh, you know, abilities. Alpha grade human beings, they will do this work. Beta grade human beings, they will do uh, this work. And growing of babies in the laboratories. There, the babies are not, uh, you know, reproduced to normal human reproduction. In that world, in that science fiction novel, the babies are grown as a, uh, you know, as um, bacteria or virus are grown in uh, laboratories. Right. So, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Set in a dystopian future, this classic novel depicts a society that practices eugenics and mass genetic engineering to produce a compliant and stratified population. The story serves as a critique of a society obsessed with control and pleasure at the cost of individuality and freedom. So again you see some of the words are getting repeated. Control, right? genetic engineering. All these are signs that the novel has been using eugenics as a background where the uh, population is created, is produced rather than reproduced. To produce a compliant and stratified population. Compliant means your biology is your destiny. That is the idea this novel is giving. That because you are born as a beta, that means you are a factory worker. Because you are born as an alpha, that means you are an office goer. Because you are born as this kind of uh, human being, therefore you should go to uh, serve the ministry. So this kind of uh, stratification has already been done before the birth of the child. More Than Human by Theodore Sturgeon this novel explores the concept of genetic mutation and telepathy. A group of individuals with different abilities come together to form a gestalt entity. But the story warns against the potential dehumanization and loss of autonomy that could result from tampering with human genetics. So more than human, the novel written by Theodore Sturgeon and it revolves around the idea of genetic mutation. Mutation is the process of uh, let's say um, when the protein that is inside the DNA chain of a uh, the, the double helix it is uh, when there is. So let me give you an idea how a DNA looks like. This is how a DNA looks like. Very bad picture, I'm sorry about that, but this is how it looks like. So it is a double helix kind of thing. And they they are these two helix are bound like this. Right. This is here, this is connected, then this is connected over here, this is connected over here, something like that. So it's a double helix kind of thing and whenever we talk about genetic engineering, this is the double helix that is what is engineered, that is what is changed. In mutation, this change happens automatically. No intervention is required by the human beings from the outside world. Mutation can happen due to radiation, some external circumstances can cause mutation in the helix of the human you know, genetic code. Once that changes, the entire human being will change, right? So, genetic mutation and telepathy. So, once the person is modified genetically, the person gets uh, the power of telepathy. Telepathy means to know what is going on in the mind of another person. A group of individuals with different abilities come together to form a gestalt entity 
but the story wants again so a group of such gifted people such people with genetic mutations and everything they come together they form an entity but the novel does not only talk about the good things but also the consequences of such modifications result from tampering with human genetics what are the bad results okay the children of men by p d james in a world where humanity faces widespread infertility the novel explores the desperation to perpetuate the species through eugenic practices so widespread infertility the entire world has been you know covered with this sudden rise of infertility and the desperation to perpetuate the species through eugenics practices somebody who can produce is made to produce more and more babies in order to keep up with the birth rate which is falling day by day so because people are not being able to reproduce on their own the few people who are remaining who can reproduce are forcibly uh, are forced to reproduce more and more it delves into the ethical dilemmas of creating a perfect generation at the cost of sacrificing individual rights and freedoms so individual right of a person to live his or her own life is suspended we were talking about this remember that if eugenics take control then there is no point in saying that there is human rights so human rights is suspended the person who can produce who has not become infertile that person is forcibly made to reproduce then we have biggers in spain by nancy cress set in a future where some people are genetically engineered to never need sleep so this is a very interesting concept improvement is one thing but not sleeping is a kind of a horrific story every day we go through we go to bed at night and we fall asleep thinking that tomorrow is a new day the mistakes of today we will never repeat tomorrow the uh, the agonies the sorrow the pain that we have received today will be lesser tomorrow so tomorrow is a very important concept for us tomorrow is hope tomorrow is something new what if somebody takes the idea of tomorrow away from you so in this particular novel this is exactly what happens some people are genetically modified Uh, in such a way that they never require sleep they can work they can remain awake for 24 hours at a stretch at least uh, for you know forever at a stretch and uh, they can function perfectly well so if such human beings are produced in future who do not need any kind of sleep don't you think that they will be the upper class people because they will be working 24 into 7 those people who require sleep the natural thing that happens to all the human beings they will be the lower class people they will have problem they will not get enough uh, employment only those people who have genetic modifications they are useful for the company they are useful for employment because they don't need sleep so they don't uh, need much time for recreation only thing they need is uh, work and recreation okay the novel explores the themes of genetic privilege inequality and the potential societal divisions caused by eugenics so inequality of course there will be uh, rampant inequality social divisions will be created based on the ability of a person and also genetic privilege the person who never requires rest or sleep of course has the upper hand as a functioning human being the gate to women's country by sherry a stepper this novel presents a post apocalyptic society where women have embraced eugenics to ensure the survival of human race the story delves into the consequences of these practices revealing the hidden truths behind the society's structure so in gate to women's country the women of that particular reality of that particular world they have embraced eugenics in order to keep the human race 
living on this particular planet and of course with all that happens there comes consequences what is the hidden truth behind these this kind of society structure that is also given step by step in this novel gather the daughters by jenny melamed in a secluded island community eugenics and selective breeding are used to perpetuate the society's ideals the novel explores the oppressive nature of such practices and the rebellions that arise from the desire for freedom and autonomy so this is the first novel we have been talking so far which talks of rebellions let me tell you in aldous huxley's brave new world also there is a component of rebellion they are called the reservations but we uh, have discussed it uh, in the previous dystopia when we were discussing dystopia so we'll move on to this thing here gather our daughters it means that it is the the title of the novel is very iconic right it is very symbolic that somebody is ordering all the daughters to be gathered together for some special purpose what is that purpose that is selective breeding that they will be forced to breed so that they can continue the civilization or they can continue that particular race but thankfully these daughters who have gathered together they not only follow the instructions or follow the oppressor's way in the beginning they slowly gather together in rebellion also they revolt against the system they try to fight the system they want to win individual freedom and autonomy at least on their own bodies we have dawn by octavia e butler in the first book of the xenogenesis octavia e butler you will um, i'm sure you have heard about her because we discussed it in uh, women and non binary authors lecture the in the first book of this uh, xenogenesis trilogy the story delves into the ethical implications of interbreeding between humans and an alien species as a means of saving humanity it raises questions about the cost of survival and the loss of human agency so in this particular novel there is interracial breeding happening when interracial breeding happens there is a possibility that human beings will not be able to pass on all the physical traits there will be uh, in this case it is not interracial interracial is what it is um, for human beings it is interspecies breeding that the uh, one human being is uh, donating the ovum the alien is donating the sperm and the zygote is formed and thereby a different species is born this is how the people in octavia e butler story wants to continue the human race but we know that is not the final answer that we are looking for the handmade tale by margaret atwood although this is not a science fiction novel but yet it talks about the possibility of the future that the infertility rates will go very high though not directly focused on eugenics this novel explores a society where women's reproductive rights and bodies are controlled and manipulated it serves as a cautionary tale about the consequences of a society that values biological functions over individual autonomy this is more or less like the previous uh, things only this is more um elaborate if you read the novel and there is also a tv series by the same name you will find it very fascinating and interesting gataka 1997 film gataka is a science fiction drama set in a future society where genetic engineering and eugenics play a central role in determining an individual social status and opportunities star trek the eugenics wars in the star trek franchise a story arc known as the eugenics wars explores a period in earth's history when genetically engineered superhumans known as augments rose to power leading to global conflicts so these are some story movie renderings that i have talked about if you want you can go and have a look at them now we come to one of the most fascinating parts of this particular lecture we will be discussing gene editing and uh, crispr and cas protein uh, technology so the idea of crispr this is actually 
uh, technological advancement that has been discussed in recent science fiction literature, movie, arts and media. Before moving on to those kind of representations, we just have to have an idea of what it is. What is genetic engineering? How do we do it really? So the full form of CRISPR over here is clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. I'm sure you don't understand. I don't understand either. But this is the full form and it is a biological term which is used for some kind of protein which acts like a scissor and another protein which acts like a stapler. It's very interesting. I'll talk about it once we go through this. Revolutionary gene editing technology that has transformed the field of genetics and biotechnology. It is a tool that allows scientists to modify the DNA of living organisms with high precision and efficiency. Those who do not have idea, let me start with the basics. We have our body. In our body, we have 10,000 to 20,000 DNA moving around in our blood system here and there, going, doing all, checking here, checking there. What is DNA? DNA is that formula or that particular combination which is a combination of proteins. It has, I'm t I was talking about the double helix, right? So it has a formation like this and there are proteins which um, connect the two coils, double helix loop. These proteins, they have the information of what is to happen next. That means, how am I going to grow? If I am born as a child, how am I going to grow? Will my hair grow very much? No. One protein says that no. Her hair should grow as much as her mother's hair grew because she has uh, uh, that kind of hair. So the protein knows that her mother had that kind of hair. So this child will also have that kind of hair. So her hair will grow till this much. This information, this code is embedded in our DNA. This DNA also tells how much time will I live. Shall I live if I don't of course die of an accident or something. This DNA knows exactly how much is the duration of my life. So after some particular years, it will signal that no, enough is enough. All the organs have failed, now uh, die. So it is the coded language. It is a code in our lifetime that is over there, right? So when we, when we talk about editing that code, Suppose I edit the DNA and say that no, instead of dying at 100 years, I am going to die after 150 years. If I can do that, if I can identify that which point at which protein this particular information is there, then I can go and modify it. First of all, I will cut that portion with a scissor, then I will staple another kind of protein inside that DNA and uh, the DNA will go around and create other DNAs and everybody will know oh, she is going to die at 150. So we will you know put our uh, first leg forward and keep her alive till 150. I am just giving you, you a rough idea. This is uh, what a non-science student understands by CRISPR. If you go and study CRISPR technology, you will be fascinated by it. Okay. Scientists have harnessed this bacterial immune system to perform gene editing in other organisms. They use a modified RNA molecule called single guide RNA that directs the Cas protein to a specific target DNA sequence. The Cas protein then acts as a molecular scissor to cut the DNA at the desired location. So one is a guide. One of this sgRNA, it is a guide. It will say, oh, cas protein, come, come, come. You have to go and cut that part. So the cas protein will go, you know, laughing and jumping and cut that part. So that is genetic editing uh, from a literature professor. DNA repair mechanisms. Once the DNA is cut, the cell's own DNA repair mechanisms come into play. 
This can lead to various outcomes such as gene knockout, inactivation, gene insertion or gene correction. So once the protein that particular genetic part is cut out then actually the stapler that is used the own cell which is carrying the DNA that cell has its own stapler. It will immediately recognize that, it, that gene oh my god it some of the portion is cut out let me go and staple now because it is to create some problem. So it will go and put in some other protein and staple it. Now this can be a good protein this can be a bad protein so we do not know. So we can edit but we cannot make the final editing ok it is up to the cell really. These are some science fiction movies which are based on genetic editing. Splice in this science fiction horror film genetic engineers uh, use CRISPR technology to create a hybrid creature by combining human and animal DNA. The movie explores themes of scientific ethics, parental responsibility and the consequence of pushing the boundaries of genetic experiment. Rampage. In this action adventure film CRISPR is used to genetically modify animals leading to their uncontrollable growth and destructive rampage. The movie serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of unregulated genetic engineering. The sixth day in this science fiction action film cloning and genetic manipulation are central to the plot. While the technology is not specifically identified as CRISPR. It involves similar themes of genetic engineering and its ethical implications. Last but not the least, advantageous. This science fiction drama takes place in a futuristic society where CRISPR like technology is used to transfer consciousness between bodies. The film explores issues of identity, social inequality, and the consequences of extreme human advancement. Now we uh, have some questions to answer, you go through the questions, have a look at it and try to answer them from your own perspective. There are lots of literature on this particular topic, I will share the references over here, see the devil in our DNA, a brief history of eugenics, literature and medicine, it was published in this journal, the new eugenics in cinema. Then Eduardo uh, Urzaiz's Eugenia, Eugenics Gender and Dystopian Society. Then we have Eugenics Literature and Culture in Post-War Britain. We have Designing a Brave New World, Eugenics Politics and Fiction. It is a very common theme in most of the science fiction critical works. So if you want to go and have a look at these questions and also consult the reference books, you will have a very good idea of what the technology is about and how you know eugenics has become a different identity in today's world. So I thank all of you to uh, you know become a part of this event where the knowledge of science and literature are combining together to form the science fiction and eugenics kind of thing. It is pure biology and biochemistry and all sorts of things are taking place over here. I thank you for your patience. I hope to see you in the next lecture.